whatever milestones that black people make against hate, it ends up benefiting all the other people of color. I can't see what his end game is. The Republican Party is the party of racism, is the party of white supremacy, is the party of hate. This is wrong and it needs to stop. Everybody wants to go back and drag that piece of history up, but they don't want to go back and deal with what their ancestors did to the indigenous people and to black people in this country. Uh-uh, you got to go. And you got billionaires talking about going to space and Jeff Bezos, go, never come back. I hope you get lost. This man has lost his mind. Boom, come on, girlfriend. What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show, the home of Epic Conversations. And I'm the host of Epic Conversations, 2020 Best Podcast News Award winner, 2018 Innovation Award winner given out by the Canadian Ethnic Media Association. Also, I host the only online program in the world for dads and fathers that is sponsored by Dove Men Care. It's also co-sponsored by Dad Central Canada's National Fathered Organization, and I am the Global Food and Drink Initiative Board Chair, and that is a multimedia not-for-profit that showcases Blacks in the diaspora that are doing their thing in food, drink, and travel. And we're broadcasting live August 21st, and like summer is flying all around the place so we do usually on saturday nights we have two of the smartest people i know come on the program aisha k staggers and jill d jones hi smart people hello <laughs> <laughs> thank you how, how we doing pretty okay good aisha are you feeling better I'm staying the same. I'm not getting worse. So I feel um, I feel a little congested, but I think I'm getting a summer cold. Okay. Well, for those on who don't know, yeah, yeah, on top of that, like, what else do we need to, to go on? Uh, Aisha did share with us last week that she has been hit by the, the C thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but she's going to overcome it, and we're happy to have her as always, and happy to have Jill always. And Already in the room, Real Django says, yay. And Jan Myers is saying hello to all of us. Hello right back to both of you as always. Hey. Well, we have a special conversation tonight. Oh, everyone's jumping in. Blue Reigns is jumping in. Okay. <laughs> so I have a feeling that we won't be asking questions. Well, I don't think we'll be asking questions much of each other tonight, but this is a, a special conversation. All of them are special conversations, but tonight especially. Tonight is Ask Us Anything night. So you can ask us anything. We may not answer it, but you can ask us anything <laughs> in regards to uh, the two wonderful ladies or myself. We're looking forward to a great conversation. But before we get into it, we need to talk about Afghanistan. Because uh, I thought if we didn't talk about it tonight, by the time we chat again next time, things are probably it's cha it's changing on a mm -hmm. on the fly. Moment, so, ladies, moment. let's chop it up a bit. What are your thoughts on Afghanistan, past, present, future? What do you think? Wow, it's um, it's really um. First of all, I don't think we ever really should have gotten into Afghanistan the way that we did. Um, we we went in there without a plan for getting out. Um, I think that um, Congress was was so into this whole oh we've got to show our constituents that we're tough on terror and this nine eleven payback that they gave um, a president without a good track record a blank check to go in there and um, he got he went through. Afghanistan to really get to Iraq, which was really where he wanted to go. Um, <clears throat> I think over the years that um, we have tried to do this whole nation building project with Afghanistan and not really surveying the um, the climate over there to really see what was the what were um, 
we want to do the nation building without kind of looking at the, the future. What if the American people ended up having a crisis in our own democracy and a crisis with a, a U.S. president that did become friendly with the Taliban? How would that then impact how Afghanistan would then, the changes that were made in Afghanistan, how would that then impact um, whether or not the Taliban would rise up again and how quickly it would. So I think that there there were a lot of um, there were a lot of things that could be foreseen, some things that couldn't be foreseen foreseen. Um, but I, I think that with the, with this administration, I think that I'm sorry, the previous administration, everyone kind of took the ball off the foreign policy because the domestic policy was in crisis. True. I mean, for me, it's uh, pretty horrific what's happening in Afghanistan. But I don't really think that we were doing very much there anyway at this point. I mean, once Trump withdrew the five that let 5,000 Taliban members out in 2020, then what ultimately happened is uh, they just got back, they got the band back together. Uh, it, essentially, and we were also pulling, you know, extrapolating some of our men and women. There were other nations that started to do the same. Uh, the man who's in power now, the eldest Taliban leader, he's the one who signed that agreement with Trump's people, Pompeo and whatnot. I think that, I think it was always set up where Trump was using that move at the last ditch hour because, well, it wasn't a last ditch hour. He knew he lost the election, but he was always going to keep something in his back pocket in case his little negotiations to say that our voter, there was voter fraud here. So this was kind of set up. I mean, you can't, got to say, he, he knows how to CYT, TA, what does it cover your CYA? And it was sort of like a booby trap in a really weird way. And at some point, um, you know, the public throughout the campaigns had been demanding that they wanted um, the troops brought home. I mean, Trump had promised to do it in his campaign 2016 run. So, you know, he always does just enough and then claims that he did the most. But he's not really claiming this because he can only claim a portion of, I was going to, if you'd have kept me in, this is how it was going to go. So that rhetoric we kind of knew was going to happen. But in all honesty, it had been dwindling down. I mean, we we had some uh, crazy moments at one point during this whole thing with Eric Prince wanting to, there was a point, remember, where they wanted to take the troops and uh, privatize it. Remember, we went through all of this stuff that was happening in Afghanistan. And in my mind, you know, Afghanistan, because of its terrain and the way it's set up with the provinces and different community leadership in that, it's very hard to navigate. Anyway, the fact that we were able to get it as under control as we did with our allies was pretty commendable. But on the downside, the people, were they thriving? Yes, there were girls in school and women and bloop de bloop de bloop But the heroin addiction and opium addiction were skyrocketed there. We had to create facilities to get 10-year-olds off of heroin. Uh, the trafficking of, of young people uh, with children because they couldn't pay their debts. You know, you've got to remember, what is it? Uh, Afghanistan is the the third largest. I mean, they are the supplier of heroin to the world. And because of the way it's situated, you know, it's in between Soviet Union and then there's Uzbekistan. There's all these different regions. So it's always been a beast. And everybody knows that. And everybody's had their handed to them when they go to Afghanistan. And all it was ever kind of set up for, sadly, is uh, money laundering and uh, contractors getting those jobs. And uh, it lost the sense of, you know, once you had Osama bin Laden, okay, and then now what? 
we're going to stay there forever. And so now we have people coming, you know, and acting like this is an act of providence and that Joe Biden is responsible for the livelihoods and the lives of these people. And to a degree, I think we are. But to another degree, you have to understand that the Taliban, they seem to appear like they want to be a different kind of uh, government this time. And they're never going to be like, you know, women without scarves and women doing, no, that's not going to happen. But on some level, we, they, we are going to have to kind of respect a little bit um, of, of uh, and, and watch. I mean, they've contacted Hamid, Hamid Karzai or all these other people. And not that we have to respect it. It's just kind of like we gave people a lot of false hope but we didn't really remedy the situation with the uh, religious aspect of it because the handover was not a big movement. It was very smooth. Their Afghanis were not fighting the Taliban when they came in. It was really a handover and it had been in the works for a while. I believe when Trump let them out, they knew that they were back in, back in form. So for me, I think, um, it's extremely sad how this, how to get people out, but I don't know any other way that this was not going to happen. And at the end of the day, we're, we're like talking about contractors who decided to stay longer. The Republicans knew in June, even before about the translators and getting them out, we had a bill that went through in July and none of the Republicans, they voted against it. And that's the big problem. And now you should pay attention to the people who have the loudest mouths in the room, because those are the ones who just Joe Biden just cut off their livelihoods. He cut off their lifelines because the Republican senators who have relationships with those contractors who got those government contracts, the ones with the loudest mouths, impeach him, do this, do that. They need to investigate every single one and follow the money because they are most likely culpable of some sort of crime and getting kickbacks from the contractors that are in Afghanistan. It would, had become a big money laundering scheme. And I will say that Joe Biden's been, he's too long in the tooth not to know how the game is played. Right. And I do feel that at this age, having lost his son and everything, there's a point of him where maybe he's just like, maybe he wants to come correct with some stuff at this point in his life. And I don't, I don't think there's a money grab here. It was just like, we got to get them out. I made this promise and they've got to come out sooner or later. I'm going to rip the bandaid off. The problem is it could have been done better, but the Republicans voted against it and they wanted this, but they also didn't realize that their money just got kaput. You know, they've been shoveling money just like what they did at the border. And uh, that those contracts, those RFI and RFPs, they belong to their cronies and it helps their regions and whatever. And I think we all know this now. We've got to really stop the corruption. And Afghanistan is a great place to hide for corruption because of the terrain and the territory. And there's always somebody to undermine another fraction. Mm -hmm. And when we're seeing with the refugees that um, are trying to leave, particularly the male refugees, they were people who aided Ameri American troops and American people, translators, et cetera, while um, the United States had pretty much occupied the territory. And their fear is retribution from the Taliban. And that's why they're trying to leave right. before all of this, before the Taliban really digs in with their form of government. And um, they're they're really trying to leave the region for that reason. But and that's, that's how despicable men. the Republicans were. They knew that, and yeah. they want to make Joe Biden's uh, administration look terrible. They knew that, and this is how disgusting they are. They're ready to see bloodshed because right. and pretend these are the same people who don't like brown people. Give me a right. break. Give me a break. I mean, are we really going to give them legitimacy? I hope uh, Chris Cuomo doesn't have one of those idiots yeah. on his show. And let's not forget that, that the that under Donald Trump, the Republican Party, they they 
had their um, Secretary of State meet with the leader of the Taliban, Trump tried to bring members of the Taliban to Camp David. Mm -hmm. Remember, he was going to do that. And the right. only reason he didn't was because he got slammed from both sides. Right. Well, well let me ask, uh, could Biden have handled this better? Like a lot of people are raking him over the coals saying, yeah, you, you know, you why did you pull out so soon, et cetera, et cetera. Does he take any blame? Could he have handled, could he handle this any better or could have handled this any better? Well, I think that he probably could have had, um, he could have maybe had some warning in the beginning if there had been a smooth transfer of power going back to November when the election came out the way that it did since um, he has taken over. There has been one thing after another on this front that um, I don't think, um, and he's had so many people in his administration that are Republican holdovers. I don't know why he has them. I don't know that they're doing him any good. Um, and so I'm wondering if perhaps he's not getting all the information that he should be getting, just like he wasn't after the election when there was supposed to be a smooth transfer of power and the Republican Party, particularly Donald Trump, dug their heels in and wouldn't share any information. And it makes mm -hmm. you wonder how much information that they had to actually dig through once they did get in office that was concealed. Well, how could he have may, had a great transition? Most of the Republicans are traitors to the nation. Yeah. I mean, they all get briefings and they're all held, supposedly held to confidentiality. But if you <laughs> believe that, I've got a pair of, I've got a two mountains that I can sell you over here. <laughs> I don't believe any of them wouldn't, wouldn't rat somebody out. I mean, I think we have a lot of rats in the building. And, you know, can you imagine you're trying to function and anything you say and uh, that it gets leaked and not leaked to the press. This stuff is getting leaked to other people in other governments, other other allegiances. This is why this is why it's actually quite horrible that that it happened the way it did. But I see that there was no other alternative. Because you can't give a heads up to everybody. How can you, how could you give this information? The Republicans are mad because they didn't get a chance to warn whoever they needed to warn. And if they wanted to do it diplomatically and uh, with diplomacy, you know, they should have said, yeah, let's get these people their visas. But the scary thing about that is even if you are revealing names of people, Who's to say that one of the senators that we have wouldn't go and give a list to the Taliban? I mean, or to Trump. It's at that point. Mm. People seem to understand the Republicans cannot be trusted with any kind of intelligence. Yeah. And how do you remove them from it? Because they really should not have access to any of it until after they de determine what happened at the Capitol, in my opinion. Well, they can't be trusted with intelligence and they also can't be trusted apparently with a blank check because look what happened with the former president of Afghanistan. He took and ran away yes, with a quarter billion dollars mm -hmm. of American money. Mm -hmm. And where did he go? Taxpayers' dollars. He went to another town. He he just left he just left the capital and went to a town and just decided he's going to be yeah, a regular I mean, citizen. It, it, it's ridiculous. It, but that me that is like they've been turning leaves for a while, you know, mm -hmm. and they that was just how they planned to leave the room. I right. mean, I'll never forget Desert Storm was such an indicator of the right. way they choose to fight. They're not fighting people. They're ready to see you. I give up. I surrender. And yeah, we know the Afghanis have been fighting with the help of Russia and all of these different things. But to be honest with you, this thing, there was a plan. I just think that the plan got out. If someone's bold enough to fight you in shower shoes, 
the gun. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I mean, know that they mean business. Okay. True. They're not worried enough to protect their feet. They mean business. So I don't see how we can look at them and think that, oh, you know, with all of our heavy um, artillery, et cetera, et cetera, we're going to come in there. Begin no, these are people who are literally willing to die. They, they join the military, not, not knowing that they may or may not die, that they may give their lives like Americans do. They join the military to give their life to a cause. But they're not choosing to fight going out. They're not out. choosing to, exactly. The reason, though, is because they have a bigger fish to fry. And they've got a lot of money. And they've got a lot of power right now. And I, I my feeling is I don't think they're going to go back to, you know, the scrappy fighting the way I think they want to play the game legitimately like any uh, regular drug dealer does, you know, and every other government criminal. I mean, none of them are any different from each other. None of them. And unfortunately, the women got caught in the middle. But if they are going to try to find a happy medium, let's see what happens. But they should realize by now that on the stage, uh, you know, they don't really have much. They're stronger if they try to come correct a little bit. They are stronger. Yeah. And with, and with them being the... Um the world, one of the world's leaders in terms of dealing heroin, it's only going to take them a minute to figure out how to um, market that as fentanyl. Straight to China. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest too. The, the interesting <laughs> thing here is if anybody was li listening to the uh, what, prime minister of Barbados was interviewed and was speaking about uh, people are like, why are you, did you make this deal with China? Because most of the Caribbean at this moment is aligning with China. And so on the BBC, they were saying to her, like, it, it, what does that leave for us here in Barbados and blah, blah, blah. And she said, well, what are you talking about? You don't say anything when America aligns with China and everybody's using China. Everybody, she said. And mm -hmm. can't hear you, Dr. Vine. China's using them more than people realize. Exactly. You know, like a perfect example, Jamaica. In Jamaica, there is a highway that's built from Kingston to Montego Bay. It's a toll highway. Mm -hmm. Most Jamaica, it's built by China. And I think they have land rights to it too for 99 years. Most Jamaicans can't afford to take it. But <laughs> she brought that up where she said, go look and see just how much in your own country, how much is now owned by China. And She's not wrong, America. We have so many things that are owned by China <laughs> look, here. Look, I Crazy. always said, and it's I was waiting for one of you to bring up China, because I think the biggest country that's going to benefit from this is China. Absolutely. Because they're going to go in there, and for people who do some reading, Afghanistan has over a billion dollars worth of natural resources, not Thank even you. including the opium and all that sure. stuff. A billion minerals, dollars. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Lithium, yeah. Like if you if you own rechargeable batteries, lithium is a main component of rechargeable. Elon batteries. Musk needs it. Everybody yes. needs it. Our people need it. They are yes. going to have to deal with China, and China is basically saying we're king. And basically, what we just witnessed was America is not the player. The player is China. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, see, see, this is the thing too. The difference between America and China, America will go into a country and say, hey, we can't deal with you because of your human rights. China don't care about that. They don't. They just they just do straight business. Straight and the business Afghanis dealing. don't care about the you Uyghurs, that what they're doing in China yes. to them. They because you see, there, there's different allegiances in all this game, and it's money is the name of the game. The interesting thing is, too, you know, I know that everybody wants to know, well, what does Joe Biden do? What is his foreign policy on this? But I do believe it was smart to back away because you could to just get out because the reality is that with Pakistan, China and Russia. Well, that's, that's another thing. And, and all the weaponry and secrets that are left there that Americans are running away from Pakistan and especially China are going to benefit huge mm -hmm. from are. intelligence. They are. So just comments wise, let's check in. 
Real Django saying my disgust for the Republican Party has gotten to the boiling point because of all the crooked, distasteful things that they've been doing since Obama's presidency. Absolutely. They're all they're all yeah. they're all a bunch of rats. Uh, he also says they're an embarrassing example of a political party in America, Jill. Blue they says are. Republicans are using this situation to deflect having to answer to the insurrection. They do not care about Afghans. True. They don't. <laughs> Uh, Real Django, I, I just wish, I think probably saying wish Pres Biden would just not have thought to pull out the military before pulling out American Afghan civilians first. They were well, contractors. They're not regular civilians. Right. They are people paid by their mercenaries. They're all of those. So that puts me to the thing of like, because I had Tina Marie when I was younger, had a sister whose uh, husband got a job in Iran. And there was a point in the 70s when we had to go to the airport and pick up Pam and her husband. And uh, when they were, were going to see them because they were coming, being moved quickly out right. of Iran. That's what it is. Ain't nobody sitting up there, you know, because the people who fell in love with Afghanis and live there and have family, they're going to stay because of love. Contractors stayed there. They knew ahead of time. They've always know that when it's coming down. Do not be fooled that it's just your regular ham sandwich white person uh, staying over in Afghanistan. There might be a couple, but you were given notice. You saw the writing on the wall. We got a few translators out a few months ago and they're here. So you cannot tell me that you didn't know. We are talking about contractors who were finishing up whatever they were doing. Now, I don't know what that is, but don't for a second go down that rabbit hole until they identify who they are that didn't get out because the people in the embassies did. Yeah. These are contractors and they have enough money to go and get their own jets, helicopters and whatever. And they, because they decided to stay so late, they put our military people at risk having to retrieve them. The only thing are when Joe Biden said for us to pull women and children and whatever, that was something that was they were told to do. But the contractors who stayed, hmm, what were they doing at the final moments? What the hell would you have to do so important that you didn't think two months before you knew the deal was signed in December of 2020 that you didn't say, I got to get out of there. Hmm. And if you left your family there, then you're in because you should have been thinking more. So no, the picture of, oh my gosh, you know, little Tammy Sue is stuck in Afghanistan and she was a teacher. You know, they, you know, that was by choice. I believe they were all told sooner and I'm not so sure but I'm talking contractors, the ones that our army actually pays for. There are Black Hawk mercenaries. There are mercenaries there. And we have our people protecting them, too. Or they protect other people who come and visit. You know? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Some people really do care about the people in Afghanistan. But it ain't the contractors. Yeah, and there's also you also have to keep in mind the time frame. There is also this big push to get all the people out of there before September 11th, the 20th anniversary. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that we'll be talking about this also for a few weeks to come. I have a feeling it's far from over, and the scenes that we're seeing of people trying to get out of there and you know hanging on to planes and things like it's just like it's just not a good look. No. Not it's a good not. one. I mean, they're the one of their Air Force women today pleaded to Joe Biden to help her family and whatever. And I'm like, girl, you I don't know if pleading on national television is the best thing. And I really do find the media to be rather insensitive with some of their questions of these people, because if y'all really want their families to survive, y'all you wouldn't be disclosing some of the information that they're out having people disclose. But one other thing is they need to, Joe Biden does need to get rid of Trump so people who worked inside mm -hmm. these departments, Homeland yeah. Security. Yep. He needs to do a full sweep because I do believe that whatever the plans were, 
that there was a rat somewhere. I really do. Mm. And it Any, was a Republican. Anything yeah. you want to add on, Aisha? Mm -mm. All right. Okay, folks. So that's our one news story for the week because the rest of our epic conversation tonight is ask us anything. So especially our regulars, this is your time to ask any of us anything you want. Now, I'm a little, little asterisk. We may not answer it, but certainly you can ask us anything you want. So we are counting on you to drive the show. You've been, we've been driving it for you for so long and you've been so great. We thought it'd be good for you guys to ask us questions. Right. So please put some questions in the comments so we can ask. And if, if you don't, we'll certainly, I can certainly start off the conversation with my few beautiful, beautiful lady friends here. So I'm going to ask you both a question. Mm -hmm. Who is an artist that you have never, give me three artists that you haven't seen that you wish you could, whether they're dead or alive. Mm. I was going to say one, but, Three, I said, give you a little bit of, <laughs> and that may not even be enough. I probably should have said 20, but. <laughs> no, for me, uh, Cesaria Evora from Cape Verde. She was Who one of my. That? She's an amazing singer, um, gifted. Uh, she sort of looked like Maya Angelou, oh. but she was from Cape Verde. And uh, so she sang in Portuguese. And if people haven't heard her music and. It's just very soldad and very, which is a Portuguese word for like melancholy. So, but it doesn't mean melancholy. It's kind of, you know, any Fado artist mm -hmm. I would have loved to have seen perform. I would have loved to have seen uh, Buena Vista Social Club when they were in yes. the day and I never got a chance to see them. And I would have loved to see list the composer oh because i'm very curious what listomania was when people you know he was the composer that uh caused listomania which is Friends when people list. were fainting and they were they were fainting it was like beatlemania but times a thousand okay. and they didn't understand this phenomena so i would like to see those because i would like to go what the hell is going on? Those are the <laughs> mind. Great cross section, Aisha. Let's see. I would have liked to see Marvin Gaye because I never got to see. Yo, you, yeah, I, I was gonna. I would. If you guys asked me, I would have said he. One of the three there. Yes. Yeah. Never got to see him. Who else? And I, I never got to see Michael Jackson at all when he was alive. Oh wow! Hmm. So that would have been interesting for me to see. He was um, good. Who else? What I want to see. Um, I think I would have liked to have seen Parliament in like the seventies when they had oh. the mothership on the screen. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. I think that would have been crazy. And ladies, you can ask me questions too. So I don't want to. Well, be what about you? What, what, what about me? Well, um, Marvin Gaye. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say. John Coltrane. Ooh, nice. Yeah. And, uh, geez, one more. And it's to just limiting it to three <laughs> is so unfair for me. Um, mm, Charles Mingus. Oh, great. Those would have been <laughs> some great, yeah. uh, great people to see. Okay, the questions I, are this, yeah. I saw Oscar Peterson, Lionel I saw Hampton. Miles Davis live. I saw Miles too. Yeah, Miles My, was great. Miles was a whole different trip. Miles was a Miles was a trip, but uh, loved him. Loved he him. Was. And, he was a lovely person. Yeah, Miles is cool. So we got our first question from the audience. Oh. Blue Rains, you all have such interesting and varied viewpoints. Any plans for any of you to write books? I'm going to be writing a book. I've been saying it for a while, but now I think I've committed to doing it. I think I'm a better suited looking back on things and looking forward to things. Mm -hmm. And I would like to put 
those together. Um, because I think now, as you get a little older, I think everybody should write a book, even if not for themselves, because it's so interesting to celebrate who you are, look back at things, the pitfalls, come to terms with them, close the book on them. Um, for me, I think it's right now when we're older should be the romance of our lives should really be with ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well put. And just to interject, both these ladies are writers. I am not. So this is an interesting question for me. So uh, you should go ahead. You know, what's so funny is that I, I'm the kind of person where if I can't find anything to read. I actually write it myself. So <laughs> I have written tons of novels for myself, no. just for myself. And like I've shared them with friends, like as I as I read them and as I write them, I, and you know I've written a whole trilogy, just because I wanted to see where it went. Um, so will I have any of them published? Um, yeah, I don't know. That's if I have a question. Any, I don't know if I have any of those published. I think I'm kind of ready to move on. You know, because I I, I spent ten years with those, so. Um, probably, probably so. I don't know if I want to, um, write nonfiction or fiction. The fiction ones tend to, to be honest, the fiction ones take more time, um, and more energy than the, than the nonfiction because nonfiction, it's fact, it's history. You go into it. It's not, it's not a, a world you have to live in. Mm -hmm. You just report basically what people have told you. And that's that. With non with fiction, you actually are creating a world, a story. You're creating characters, and you kind of sit and live with them. In right. A world, a make believe world. So Blue Rains is saying it's time to get them published. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, I think. Uh, for me, I think it's just a little harder because to pin me down, you know, I am kind of opinionated, but if you notice, no. I but <laughs> my opinions can change. That's the one thing I do like about myself. I'm always open to, I'm done with that belief yeah, system. It, it, it's I, interesting. You know. it's, I, I'll just excuse you. you. You're very honest about that. And it's very true because in the last few months, your thoughts of the democratic party have swayed they have yeah i think i'm a fair person i think i yeah. i try to see things very balanced i don't think one side is all 100 but yeah i mean if you're doing dirty then yeah i don't like it yeah uh, for myself uh a number of people have asked me this and mm -hmm. I, I i was very close a little while back uh but if i I guess I will have to write a book, but what I'm planning to do and myself and these two wonderful ladies, we've discussed of publishing a book of some of our best conversations. So family, if you, yes. think, if, if you yeah. think that's something that you would like to get in an ebook form, please tell us in the chat or contact me. But I, we've, we've chatted about it lightly, but certainly your feedback as always would be very valued. Uh, myself writing a book about my own story Mm -hmm. Maybe but I probably have to get a ghostwriter because for me to sit down so, and do it, it would be that worse. I'd have to like dictate it and someone put it into book form. But I, I, mm -hmm. I think the time is coming because I've had an interesting life online and offline. And it's interesting this year. I've been interviewed so much this year and just very, very interesting. And people want to find out from some, some reason about this black shiny head. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Blue Rain says, I think that is a great idea. What else to that about the, you? So, family, tell us if you'd like, if you'd be willing to purchase an ebook of some of the best conversations. Please give us the feedback. So, see, the, the questions are flowing now, ladies. So, be yeah. ready. They're okay. ready. I do have um, PDFs of the chapters that I've published in books and anthologies. I have those. And what I plan to do with them, I have no idea. Oh, real Dango saying, mom always told me that these politicians all learn from the same books. So they're all basically the same yep. people calling <laughs> themselves different parties. <laughs> so, true. so true. Next question, keeping in the T Stevens and welcome T Stevens. Aisha Jill, what are your 
top three favorite books. Whoa. Oh, I don't know. God. Betsy Brown by Ntozaki Shange. I read that when I was, oh gosh, I think I must have been like 12 or so. I love that book. Um, oh, gosh. I love Ntozaki Shange's books. Yeah, her play was great too. Yeah. So Sassafras, Cypress, and Indigo is another one of her books that's one of my favorites because it's about three sisters and I'm one of um, three girls, um, you know, but my mother's children. And we are a lot like those characters in that book. And Sula by um, Toni Morris. Oh, okay. wow. Okay. Well... Very nice. Hard to follow. I mean, I can't, I know I, there's so many and it's hard for me to put them all like in one go, but um, there's a book. I, I love To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm. That is just a great book uh, for me. Um, I still remember it. Um, and I, of course, love the film of it. I thought Harper, I don't know what her personal life was. And sometimes I don't want to know sometimes with some of these writers, you know, I, I just love that I went on this journey and it, it just had that whole small town feel that was so much like, like my town growing up, you know, with some of the crap that went on and there was segregation, but there were all the niceties, although we never had you know, like a Boo Radley and all that kind of stuff. But we, as kids playing, it's such a visual thing for me to see. I can see it outside of even, you know, seeing the film. Um, there's also a book that I'm really like, I, I take it everywhere with me. And it's a book by this German philosopher, really, called Richard David Precht. And his translation in English, it's, he, he's only done like a few books in um, English. They've been translated, but I really love it. It's called Who Am I? And if so, how many? Because it's really Precht Ver Bin Ich. Um, uh, it's called Ver Bin Ich, and I can't really pronounce it, but I'm always like reading certain things and trying to get better at German and doing the translations. Um, he, I... One thing I do wish that uh, sometimes it's easier when you don't know a language and you take a lot of time to get something translated. I actually think you live with it more, but it's so it's basically about ethics, morals, decisions that you we have to make as a society, as a culture, as a people, euthanasia, uh, stem cell research. I mean, it's all all the problematic things that I love this book and it really you know, calls us on the carpet. And then another book that I always seem to have, and I think it's really just, it, it's called The Art of Seduction. And um, I can't think of the writer's name. And he wrote another book. And some people don't, let me make sure, and it's by my bedside all the time. So it's Robert Greene. And Robert Greene wrote other other books. I know we had another one I read, but you know, the art of seduction goes into breaking down categories of people's psyche. And there's the dandy, there's the, you know, seduct different ways that people seduce, whether they are seducing mm, politically, uh, the char charismatically, uh, subtly, passive aggressively. So he kind of identifies everybody into these shapes and some people I've had a few friends who go this is a disgusting book because it's teaching you how to you know I was like what seduce to, but not always sexually you can seduce people in so many ways mm -hmm. and so the book is really an interesting exploration that's sort of my trashy exploration <laughs> so, you know, profiles of people oh well, for, Dr. well, there's so many, but three that come off the top of my head. There's a book about men, because I'm very passionate about helping men and fathers. A book by T.D. Jakes called He Motions. Mm, wow. That, that was written. 
it was written at least 10 to 15 years ago. And then I had, he actually toured for that book and I had a chance to uh, attend a stop on the tour. And uh, it's, it's really breaks it down about a man's relationship with his self, mm -hmm. his family and other men. Oh, wow. And it's an amazing, and yes, even though he's a pastor, and all that, it, I recommend it to every man that I'm helping say it's a really deep emotion. And, and also ladies read that book. It is a great book to read. And when I went to see the tour at the end of it, it was only, it was a place that held about 1500 people. And at the end of the evening, he had a thousand men holding each other's hands in the audience. It was. Oh, wow. That's, we need more of that. Yeah. Powerful moment. Mm -hmm. uh, another book. I'll keep on the men. This is the book that actually started my journey. Well, man, it's called Black Men, Obsolete, Single, and Dangerous. Oh, and, whoa. <laughs> and this book, there's a story behind it, but this book is uh, written in, wow, when was it written? I'll tell you in just a second. 1990. Mm -hmm. And before, I actually it was, and it's a part of a question that'll be coming up with Cinnamon Canella. So I'll, I'll, uh, pause and then oh, I'll lead into I'll lead into the next question because she has it for me so that's another book and then another book that I read a book called The Four Agreements. Oh I love The Four Agreements. That's by my bedside too. I have I, I read books. that I read that at least once a year. It's true. It's it's a really great book and it's an easy read but it's oh. a deep it's a deep read. But you know the one mastery of love is beautiful. Okay. That's his other book. I recommend it. Mastery of Love is beautiful. It's a beautiful book. I actually got Mastery of Love better than Four Agreements. It took me a couple times going back. Wow. Family, there are great questions coming on. So I'm going to get to the next. So the next one, Cinnamon Canella. Welcome, welcome as always. Hello. Question for Dr. Vibe. How long has it been since the program started and what was the motivation? So this piggybacks to what I just answered. Uh, the program, I did my first conversation all I had was a laptop and a dream and myself and a co-host who I had at the time, we did our first conversation about Michael Vick and the dogs. Oh. So I don't know, Sunan Canella, if you remember that, if not, go look up Michael Vick and the dogs. And that's, and that precluded that I was, there was a bookstore in Toronto called Burke's bookstore. Actually, they're going to be reopening it because there's very few black bookstores in Toronto. I think right now there's only two in the mm. greater Toronto area. And Mr. and Mrs. Burke's Burke, great people. It was a great hangout for me. And after I graduated from university, I said, God, I don't have to read any more books about <laughs> nothing I can't relate to and all that. And I went into their store, like I always did, saw this book and sat down, read a chapter, bought it, and read the whole book that night. And that gave me the catalyst to say, you know, with my college radio experience, I said, some way, somehow, I'm going to create a brave and safe space for, at that time, Black Canadian men to share their stories. Instead of me seeing them in the media being portrayed as, it, with the law or entertainers, and right. when I mean entertainers, and everything from a performer to athletes, because athletes are entertainers. They're sure. getting paid to perform. And that started the journey 35 over 3500 conversations ago who so that 3500 uh, wow 3500 conversations wow. ago so Whew. and the motivation now is, is still the same to give well give people especially people of color a, a safe and brave space to tell their story because i am a firm believer that everybody has a story and part of it will help someone around the world. That's Because there's, yeah. there's too many people that die without telling their story. So I just want to provide a safe and brave space for them to share their story. So that's uh, a little about me. Let's go to the next question. Blue Rains asks, where can we find Jill and Aisha's published works? <coughs> Boy. Let's see. Mine are all over the place. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to, that's what I'm trying to sit here and think. Um, I have a muck rack profile in all my published articles. Um, 
are all my published articles are usually updated on there as I write them and as they're published. So I usually tell people just to go to that profile because um, if you Google it and you Google my name, you'll find it. Um, just because the most update, most updated articles are there, and you can actually go back. Um, I don't know how far it goes back. I know the number of articles it goes back. It goes back about close to 300 articles. Wow. Um, on just the, the, the spool. And then in the static profile box, it goes back 120 um, articles. So I don't know. And that that's, I think that's only going back to, to 2017. Wow. So it's not even going before that. Great. And mine, I mean, I write for a magazine called Ubiquist, and um, it's a quarterly, every quarter we put out a magazine. It's a fashion, beauty, art, uh, very international platform. It's um, in over 300 places in Europe. I know you can get it, uh, subscribe to it, or order it. And uh, I think that we're working on launching it a little more online or that aspect. But right now the audience that it sort of caters to are people who still like print and um, who still like a beautiful photography and beautiful artworks. And these are with some of the most notable people from around the world on many levels. I've interviewed uh, Baroness Valerie Amos, who was the UN secretary, uh, uh, under uh, Tony Blair. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. And um, I've done some really great interviews. Quincy Jones. Oh, um, he's a person I'd love to sit down with. Yeah. And then I've done some things from pop culture to uh, charity. John Rose, who was the founder of Waves for Water, started by putting uh, water wells in Haiti during that other earthquake. earthquake. And that's um, how we could have talked about Haiti tonight, but wow. I know. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's where my stuff is at the moment. And I'm really considering putting them up uh, on something like a muck rack. I'll talk to Aisha and let ask you to tell me how to do all of this. Because I kind of really like stepping outside and I like hearing stories. I had this one woman, Michelle Saunders, that I interviewed and she was like a big in the old school days back with house music at, at the garage. Yeah. And Mich Michelle is this beautiful French Epicurean essentially because she was, she loved dancing and she'd be at the garage, you know? And uh, then she cooked these big meals for people in New York after you'd been partying all night, not leaving until like 11 in the next morning. You wouldn't go to the club until three. Now, Michelle, and those, so finding those wonderful characters and those people to tell their stories. And the magazine is just full of really exceptional people. I have a new one coming up with um, Isabel uh, Colombo, who is a African American, um, no, she's French African, but she lives in Harlem and she is a painter and she does these amazing portraits of black women and men in settings that we don't ordinarily see historically. So where you would see maybe Marie Antoinette, it's gonna be, you know, a beautiful black woman or just putting them in the finest of finest of luxury. It's an, and her, she's a fine artist. So her paintings are in museums. And then I also just did an interview with Drina De Niro, who um, is uh, an actress, producer, and she has an amazing little uh, a short film coming out that's dealing with um, with identity issues, like this new identity culture that's going on. And the crazy thing is Drina had made this movie years ago and uh, the festivals just sort of wanted it back. So that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm just very finding, and, and we've got old school photographers like Jean-Baptiste Mondino and, and old, a designer, Sophie Talley. I mean, it's really a gorgeous magazine. So enough about me. 
This well, is this the only place a, I vent my politics, you know. Well, see, I was, and you're reading my alleged mind. I'm gonna say, see, people, there's more to these ladies in politics, okay? Yeah, there's absolutely. More to, they, they they do have a life outside of the political reign. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a break right now, mm -hmm. and uh, we're gonna come back with some more questions. And yeah, everyone, thank you so much. There are really good questions, and because uh, we're sort of ping-ponging about, should we do this? Should we do this? And you're proving us right. So I appreciate it. So we'll be back in just a moment and uh, we'll come back with some more questions on state of things with Aisha and Jill. Ask them anything. <laughs> and they they were concerned. I know they said, oh, what are they going to ask us? You've been behaving yourselves, family. Let's see if you're going to behave yourself for the second half. Hold tight. Go. So ladies, what is going on? Just that he needs to get it together. Sick of that. I am sick of it. Something is seriously wrong with you. Is that, I mean, why is he still there? Shouldn't She shouldn't be near Congress. You need an exorcism because I don't know what <laughs> yeah. is wrong with you people. It was so powerful. And I really wish everybody would stop bowing down to this. What, what is he talking about? <laughs> this makes no sense. They know they are not the oppressed party, but they love being the superior ones and they want to flaunt it. So it was always made political, particularly for people of color um, and the LGBTQ population. We end off every episode with a cockroach. This episode is cockroach. Ah, all everything. The everything? <laughs> all the things are going on. All the things? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, here we go. We're back. We are back and uh, back on uh, State of Things with Aisha and Jill and myself. And it's Ask Us Anything night. So it looks like this has been a success already and we'll do it again in the near future. We are also uh, always, uh, always good to ask us questions anytime you can email me. So let's get to our next question. And I was waiting for this one to come up. What are y'all listening to currently music-wise? Mm. Um, wow. I think I've gone back to re really re-listen to some of the 90s music because I was in my early 20s in the 90s and like, well, late, I was in my mid to late teens and then early 20s. Um, and so I've gone back now to kind of explore it at this age to see what I've actually missed. Oh, interesting. What I didn't pick up on when I was too busy just listening to it for, you know, just dancing and all that kind of value. And now just kind of trying to really think about it, where it fit in into the, the, the whole culture of everything that was going on in the 90s. Cool. Jill. I have been listening to the band Phoenix, um, mm. like obsessively. You'd think I was a teenager. And, you um, are. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of, um, I like the Tiamo album because it reminds me, well, it was sort of created to make you feel like you were in Italy during the summer and, you know, all the things that, you know, go on and fun, light. Uh, and the album is interesting because it came off of the heels of uh, the Bataclan in Paris. And so it was sort of a defiant happiness, uh, finding your happiness. And I think that that it really um, was something that I needed to get into this year at this moment in time because, you know, there's just so much to be angry about. And I just wanted to just get in my car and drive or put my headphones on and just lay on the grass somewhere and just imagine I'm somewhere else. And, um, and yeah, it always seems to put a smile on my face. And then I've been, but like obsessively listening to them. It's like, it's crazy. And going back through the whole catalog and uh, finding, you know, you know, then from there going, maybe I too have been a little bit in the 90s with some of my acts too. I think I was 
day I was listening to Nirvana for a minute. And then I said, I got to take this off because I'm about to like have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was really interesting just to hear uh, these people with these really great lyrics and great songwriting and, uh, you know, words that you would never think could be in songs. So for me, yeah. But really for me, it's been Phoenix lately. And, uh, you know, just kind of enjoying that. Good, good. Well, for me, uh, this is the kind of stuff I've been listening to lately. Yes. And me too. I am a soul for house baby. Yeah, I, I've been I, doing house too. That's so oh, funny. I, I, wow. So I love my soul for house. I think like I, I could listen to soul for house mm -hmm. 24 seven. Yeah. Easily. I am. It's a good break too. It takes your mind somewhere, but yeah. yeah, for me, it's been more upbeat. You're right. And what else? Is that it? No, I actually, um, there's a group that I've been a long, 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 long time, especially during the pandemic, I've been able to dig into some of my musical stuff. And um, huge fan, well, not as much, well, in their early years, a group called Level 42. Oh, huge. I love them. I toured with them, yeah. You what? I toured with them. You're, you know, I opened for them. Oh, my goodness. I uh, love, like, the first 10 years of that band. Like, Very cool. Like, absolutely love that band like yeah. incredible bass player mm -hmm. the bass and keyboard player oh my goodness mike lindup he just released a, a recent song called time to let go i've I, i've been like like listening over and over and the lyrics are so meaningful time to let go them like that that just right there it's time for us many of us to let go of some things i've just uh really got into that uh back listening to uh Level uh, um, Pat Metheny, or Chris. Some, yeah, Chris is back. Pat Metheny <laughs> is probably the artist I've seen the most. I've seen Pat Metheny ten times in concert. Oh wow! Yeah, huge, huge fan. So uh, that and uh, believe it or not, folks, I, I'm a I'm a fan of prog rock too. So <laughs> yeah. So the, and and here's a crazy thing, folks. In my time, I actually saw Van Halen live three times. So, oh, my God, yeah. So I've got a very, very, very music taste. So right now, so Do you Mahone, like Michael Kiwanuka? Yes. I think he's awesome. Yeah, I've been. And, uh, and Tom Mish. Yep. And uh, uh, there's another one, and I can't remember his name, but he's. I was listening to him yeah. the other day. So like Jill, my music goes Rush, all around Rocky. the place. I'm all Rusty. around the place. Sometimes you'll hear me listening to Rush. I have so much <laughs> respect for that band. I get so I so if people want to chat me offline, you'll get the alleged music mind of Dr. Vibe, actually. So a little little um novelty fact. My father is a huge record collector. He's actually a member of the final oh, wow. record collectors hall of fame of America Hall of Fame. Mm. So that's where I got all my music from. So Whoa. so if you ladies ever come to Toronto. I definitely would have to have you hang out at his house for a while because one of his greatest joy is just to play music for people. Yeah, my I father is that. the same way. And for his his collection, my father's collection is so big, he can't even keep it all in the house. A lot of it is stored. Yes. My dad has I gotta have to take a picture and well, maybe next uh next show I'll show my dad's man cave. Yeah. He's yeah. a real man cave. Oh yeah. All yeah, right, sure. and Chris. Good to have you, Chris, and you're a level yes, 42 Chris. fan. Yes, Chris. Yes, Chris. Wonderful. Let's get to another question. And this is one I was going to ask, too. Any penless bilingual or more? Everywhere I've ever lived, I think I pick up a fraction of something that's going on just to get around and move around. But to, you know, for German, I think I'd have to spend my rest of my days trying to learn that. They've got so many words. Um, uh, Italian, a little bit. I, for, I was there, living there for a while at one point in Rome. Um, but the Italians let you do, you know, it can be so bad. It's such a beautiful language. Um, with all the different boyfriends I had from different countries, I should be like speaking about, I don't know, I should be... Working at the UN, my own damn self. <laughs> <laughs> well, from the White House to the UN, from press secretary to the UN. 
I know just enough <laughs> of everything. <laughs> and I, 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 I'm, I'm very hesitant to know what you know in each language. Well, you know, I mean, it's true. <laughs> and, and French for sure. Like, uh, but you know, it's mainly more my ear has picked up. Uh, I can hear, watch TV shows, and know what's going on. What's really weird, though, is I found that as you get older, you um, you get less musical in your ear with certain things. I can't remember damn lyrics to people's new songs like I did when I was a kid mm. on the radio. You know, I'd be like, "The hell is my daughter listening to?" Okay, mm. you know, but whatever. Aisha, yourself? Um, I can read Spanish pretty well. Okay. It's um, because it's one of the Romance languages, mm -hmm. I have very little trouble going between that and some of the other ones in print. Okay. It's the speaking um, point. If someone asks you to, like, the, the, the trying to translate, yeah. however, I can manage yes. enough. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, but reading it, I can read it very well. Well, M M Catherine, Andre Simone's wife, Catherine mm -hmm. Copeland, um, we have this thing now, funny enough, through the pandemic, where we will only speak German to each other because on the phone or whatever, because she speaks German. But, you know, it's like, who, who do you speak to? Like, just and... Then my daughter, um, her dad speaks Farsi and she's, she speaks some, you know, it's like, it's weird. It's like when you don't let your kids like speak it all the time with you, sometimes they'll end up with the baby version. Um, if that makes sense. It's like, because there, there are elevated levels to the vocabulary and language, but yeah, with my daughter. So I picked up some Farsi as well along the way, because I was living with my uh, in-laws at one point when I was younger, just had the baby. So I heard a lot. Man Raftam, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for myself, uh, uh, un peu français. And uh, mm. when I was in my last year of high school, I got 75% in French. I said, I'm going to university. I don't know how I got this mark in high school. So there's no way I'm going to go risk it. In yeah. university, but I I have a little bit of regret that I wish I could would have continued with it, and I do make trips to Montreal and Quebec. Montreal, your English is tolerated in Quebec City. No, no, you know, so it's not. it's it's not. So a little bit of regret in that I didn't. But it's always interesting when I'm in those cities. Then they say, "Oh, you understand?" Yeah. yeah. So it's I say not fully, but I you know I understand it's so the. So you're cool. So there you go. So that's Just to hold those intellectual conversations. is yeah. tough. Yeah. So let's move on. I, mean, uh, I think that this question is for Aisha, but it should be for both. Are you going to be running for anything, Aisha? Um, not in my immediate future. Um, <clears throat> there are some things coming open in um, my local area. I'm really just kind of waiting it out and looking at the um, political landscape. Um, this, the congressional seat, for example, in my district, Rosa DeLauro has held on to that for a very long time. And I don't see it going any other direction. People here really like her. Mm -hmm. um, um, but like local state, the state house in the state Senate, those are always um, open. And they're const they are constantly changing. They tend to be a little bit more on the progressive side. Right. Jill. I don't think I could stand being around no. any of them. <laughs> I think I, I, they think Nina Turner was bad. You know, I was looking at Nina Turner the other day and I said, why don't I feel her sometimes and go, oh, she makes me so mad. And then I said, Nina Turner is a lot like me with her mouth, like just boom, <laughs> saying it. And I, I respect that. But I also know that on the whole, some of it, <clears throat> you got to know when to hold your tongue and know when to use it. Um, 
I don't know if I could be around all these people because, you know, I'd be sent there as a Democrat. And then the next thing you know, I'd be like, I can't stand any of you all right now. Get out of my face. I'm who I want to be. That's exactly you don't have it. to vote the way you want me to vote. <laughs> So I don't know if I'm the best. Uh, oh, you know. we'll we'll phone the Jill D. Jones party. <laughs> I know, right? The Jill D. Jones party. I see that. Uh, the common myself, sense party. Yeah, there you go. Mm. There you go. Uh, for myself, uh, who's zooming who party? There you go. <laughs> who's zooming who? Who's zooming who, zoom who party? <laughs> yes. Uh, for myself, I've not considered, but I've been asked. Uh, at various times over the last few years, I I see what they go through, and it's just nah, nah. And and I think if you look at it, you can be more powerful outside of politics than in politics. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's kind of like you're just whoring for money all the yeah, time as a politician. Yeah, yeah and yeah. you know, got to toe the party line and all that. Yeah. Like, nah, that's... Mm -mm, mm -mm. If you had asked me when I was 31, my answer would have been different. It would have been like, yeah, absolutely. But right now, it's kind of like... Yeah. If they remove money from the politics, which they never will, then, you know, you'd see a lot of people who wouldn't want to be in it anymore. And maybe we'd get really good people then. Yeah, be in for the right real way. reason. Mm -hmm. Serving the people. Okay, let's continue on. So emotions is a must read. Excellent. I fully agree. Black beauty saying it is so interesting how books that we read from the past have become so comforting in these COVID times. True. Uh, another question I was hoping get asked. Have you all met in person? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. Uh -uh. Mm -mm. We have not. I'm well, especially during COVID I'm in no. Canada. These two ladies in the U S it ain't happened, but if and when it does, we'll do a live broadcast together. For sure. That would and I be... would love it to be in Toronto because to I love Toronto. Hey, we here. I can I get could the live I live in Toronto. I could do I got the studio, so I can get the studio space like that. Yeah. So we will look into that. Keep on pushing us on that one. Uh Sino Canela, let me just see. So I have put where you can find Aisha and Jill's writings in the Facebook and Twitter, I mean, Facebook and uh, YouTube comments. So go for it. Ah, Sinma Canella. And this ha has to be Jill's question first. Favorite food? I know Jill likes to bake. How about Dr. Vibe and Aisha? Are you good cooks or bakers? Or like me, good eaters? Wonderful <laughs> question. Jill, go at it first. You're our cu cuisine or queen. Um, for me, of course, I bake my breads, uh, doing a lot of Kaiser rolls lately, German ones. Um, I think I pretty much, I've really been focusing a little bit more on more vegan mm. to make it really taste good, like with different vegetables and, yeah. uh, that still accommodate my husband as well. Who's not a vegan. And I'm not necessarily one either. I'm leaning more into the vegetarian world. But, you know, I did, I do have a culinary background because there was a time when I worked uh, assisting a chef. Um, okay, Jill, you got to write a book. Come on now. <laughs> and I remembered when he was doing his book and putting the recipes together and then, you know, you test them all out. It was real, that was an interesting world. But talk about a hard job. I think oh, yeah. my favorite yeah. food, though, is Japanese food. Okay. I love Japanese food. And that's why, you know, they eat a lot of meat and they yeah. also eat a lot of fish. Fish. So for me, you know, it's to adjust those things, uh, it's going to be interesting. And that's what I've been on okay. adjusting those recipes. Mm, my favorite food. Um, gosh, my favorite food is actually cucumbers. Mm. Oh, I wow. love, I love cucumbers. I will eat them like sliced thin, like potato chips with different kinds of salad dressing on them. I oh, that's cucumbers. nice. That's a healthy snack. I just love cucumbers, and it's like 
It's like, oh gosh, I have to have a cucumber every day. Right. So, um, you know what? Since I've been sick with the COVID, I actually have taken to making vegetable soup. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. But not just like with regular, you know, like the peas and corn and carrots and stuff. I'm not, a, right. I don't like cooked carrots. So instead of carrots, I've used sweet potatoes and butternut squash. Mm. Mm. Right. I've used um, mushrooms in it. I've put um, uh, zucchini squash, yellow squash. I've uh, zucchini bread, maybe, please. Hmm? Zucchini bread, please. I, I love zucchini, zucchini bread. bread. Really oh, good. Yeah, it is really I good. love. Oh, I love. But this soup has like Fantastic. helped me so has helped me so much in terms of just feeling better. Mm-hmm. Um, with all the vitamins and things in it. Of course, I have green beans and peas and stuff in it, and then mm-hmm. I have ginger in it. Okay. I've been using that ginger like crazy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I do cook. My family, okay. however, does not allow me to cook because there are so many cooks in the family so, <laughs> so it's like usually when we have like um dinner or whatever it's like uh you bring the drinks or the bread or something like that <laughs> so i don't oh get really cook. yeah i don't get to cook i don't get to make the macaroni and cheese and my macaroni and cheese is actually really really good you know and but that's something i've never I don't got get the loving for mac and cheese i just I think I it's a real American thing. My husband doesn't like it either. I'm not. I, I'm not feeling. They don't it, understand it. Pasta, I, yes. Yeah, right? I. I don't know, but maybe if we ever meet Asia, you can change me. Yeah, I did make something very cool. You might like this. It's a uh, six medium carrots with one orange, mm-hmm. two spring onions, thirty grams of walnuts, one teaspoon of dried chili flakes. Um, your carrot should be like 450 uh, grams, by the way. Uh, three tablespoons of EVO, um, a juice of lemon, and some flat leaf parsley and sea salt and whatever. And so when you shred the carrots, you shred them and then you basically chop everything fine and you put it together and make basically a salad. Add a little bit of like cumin and a little bit of harissa. And it's like, it tastes like a Moroccan, like Moroccan food. Uh, yeah. Because it, when you make sure you have the orange and you slice the slice it and uh, get the white part off and put it in there, it's an incredible salad. And even throw a few raisins in there and put it with some rice. It's ridiculous. It's yeah, so I can't good. have it because the fresh citrus. Oh, right. Damn. Well, and what for, about you, Dr. Vine? Sorry. Uh, I, no problem. It's interesting. Over the summertime, I've been going more, uh, less and less meat and protein. Yeah, I've been eating a true. lot of salads. And, like, and twice a day, I'll have like some fruits and some nuts. Uh, like in the morning time, I'll have some fruits, nuts, like walnuts. And then the in mid-afternoon, I'll have a salad. Uh, so, And I still do nice. the protein stuff. I love my fish. Every once in a while, I have a steak. I love to barbecue. Love right. to barbecue. I barbecue all year round. And I was, uh, even up to last night, uh, put some pineapple on the barbecue and sprinkled cinnamon mm. on it. That is amazing. Pineapple on the barbecue Ooh, with I love pineapple, but I've never tried the cinnamon. I'll yes. have to try that. It's cinnamon. It's really, really good. Uh, and just, I-, I love to cook. I really do. And, uh, and, for people say, I'm like, for me, TV wise, I'm a huge Food Network fan. Huge yeah. Food Network fan. I love, like, more than anything else, I love my Food Network stuff. Uh, I love MasterChef. Ameri- US folks, US MasterChef is okay. If you can watch MasterChef from England, yeah, you're or right. Australia, it's really good. Yeah. That's a whole different level of what home cooks are doing. It's a whole different crazy. level. Crazy. What you sent me is yeah, crazy. Yeah. Just like, uh, so there you go. So let's move on here. Yes, Chris is back. Chris is hey, back. Chris. Yes, Chris. Level 42. Yes, I yes. I see that Black Beauty asked us what I we got, did got on our downtime, here. right? I got Black oh. Beauty asking, ladies, how do you relax and wind down from a, on a stressful pandemic news-filled day? Good question. I watch my murder shows. And I watch HGTV. 
Okay. It's like I, I just I watch Dateline. I watch Dateline. I, yes, I'm a oh. Dateline fanatic. Yeah, even the Datelines, even the ones with Tamron Hall, Dateline yeah. fanatic. Yes. But no, I look on TV. I go to TV One, and I watch Fatal Attraction. And ATL oh Homicide is my show. Oh, oh I become a big fan of that. Those two guys are amazing. They are amazing. They yes. are so good. I love those guys. I've become a, a I've become a junkie of that show. And but I'll also watch shows like Bar Rescue. Oh, is, I've uh, seen Bar Rescue before. I love I love the Bar Rescue stuff. But uh, and but yeah, I, I don't watch as much news as I used to because. Too many times news outlets have their own agenda, mm -hmm. so I don't really watch. But uh, but having conversations with wonderful people like this is like yesterday. I had four hours of conversation just introducing people, and I felt so good after that, bringing some people together that are doing things with the right intent and right reasons. So, and I'm getting back into doing my indoor spin classes again. Oh, that good. Is, That's nice. I'm really virtual classes. Love it so. Yeah, and hang out with family. Yeah, do those things and just check up on people because when I have challenges, ninety nine percent of the time I reach out to other people and see what's going on in their lives, and most of the time it's ten times worse than what I'm going through. Yeah, you know, I, I go sit on the balcony. I deal yeah. with my plants and and cooking or something. I mean, which I always pretty much do anyway. But I find that I'm better. I go internal home. I don't really. Yeah. Or go for a walk in nature. I'm trying to do that more, you know, yeah. set without a bunch of people around. You know. Yeah. So Aisha, this Chris, this question is for you. Chris is asking, are you prepped for the impending hurricane? Mm. Um. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> okay. Is it a hurricane or is it not? You've been very I know, blessed. So about it is a hurricane. I'm. I'm. Um. I'm prepped. Um. It's gonna probably hit us um, a little hard. Um, oh, um, because we're all, we're just off the Sound, the Long Island Sound. But I think right. it's gonna hit like Westport, Stamford area toward New York, worse because it's supposed to move veer west. Oh, I think Wait. we're gonna get hit in hard and heavy with so a lot of rain. So it came in, and then it's just gonna go. Yeah, it's supposed to hit the Long Island like really, yeah. really heavy. And wreak havoc in the um, Long Island Sound, so we'll probably get the heavy rain. But yeah, it's like beer west, yeah. so it's gonna yeah. probably hit that tail end of Connecticut really bad. Crazy. Good. So yes, I am. I'm somewhat. Um, I'm somewhat prepped in terms of do I have medication and water and all of that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's move to our next question. Fabulous questions. I, Aisha and Jill, you are such strong women. What would you say is your biggest strength? I don't suffer fools. <laughs> that, is, that is honestly, I, I had to grow into that, but that, that's my biggest strength. Um, I'm not afraid to be wrong about things. Mm -hmm. I okay. think I'm, I'm not afraid to anymore. I think earlier being younger, <clears throat> failing was like, oh my God, you know, but I, I think uh, I'm not afraid of that anymore. Hmm. For myself, uh, I've been told I'm a great listener mm -hmm. and that I listen with my head and my heart. And uh, yeah, because a lot of people don't feel respected in this world. And one of the best ways you can give respect to someone is listen, listen to them. So I've tried my best. And like I say, I've done this over 3,500 times. And I also do it a lot offline, helping men and other people. So that's my, my greatest strength. And the reason, probably one of the reasons why is when I was growing up, my dad was a public school teacher. And I told him wow. that. Yeah. And, and, it's a, and, I felt, and I told him after a few years, I said, Dad, I feel more like a student than your son. Yeah. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Cause, cause, and, uh, and I said, and he said to me, about 10, 15 years ago, you said, son, you are a better listener than I am. You have taught me how to be a good listener. Oh, that's so sweet. And that's good that he learned that. Yeah, because I said, well, dad, you're just used to telling people what to do and not listening back. Right. You're just, but he said, yeah, that would I say 
the listening thing. Uh, so let's move on here as we begin to write down because we could go on for a while here. Uh, Isha, you would be great in the political uh, arena. Rosa Dolor is about <laughs> 90. She's tired and a good reason to have term limits. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you should do it. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm happy that we finally got rid of uh, Chris Dodd and um, Lieberman. I mean, look how oh long it took just gosh. for us to get to Chris. Our Murphy. whole lifetimes. My whole life. I mean, I, I was like in my late 30s until, you know, until Chris Murphy and um, what's his name? Oh, gosh. All I can think of is his, him formally being our attorney general. I see his face. But the other guy, okay. <laughs> until they um, until they actually were able to um, take over, you know, Richard yeah. Blumenthal, until they were right. able, oh, Blumenthal, um, okay. oh yes, until they were able to get their seats. I mean, they 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 people that were in for like 36, 33 years. Uh, okay, there should have been term limits on that. All right. Those should be there for a lifetime. So before we have our last question, just want to get some other comments here. Blue Rain says, love Dateline, 48 hours, snapped, fatal attraction. I've also become a big uh, ID fan. Yes. Investigative discovery, yeah. lots of stuff. Uh, ID and oxygen. Yeah, and I'm a huge... And uh, there's a guy on auction now who used to be on 48 hours, Troy. can't remember his last name. But uh, he used to be on 48 Hours has a show there that's great. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Joe Kenda. Love mm -hmm. attended. <laughs> I think, and the way he delivers his commentary, his voice is just, oh, yeah. just amazing. Now, uh, Blue Range, yeah, all of them. Yep. And so our last conversation piece for tonight, of course, Chris slips it in. Ah. If you weren't in your current professions, what other field would interest you? Honestly, when I was little, I wanted to be um, the president of Motown Records when I was little. Wow. <laughs> that's what I always wanted to do. Yeah. Oh, that's so cute. Very nice. Jill? Um, well, I've done a lot of things, you know. <laughs> yes. We're, and we find out more each episode. <laughs> and, you know, my hobby was interior design, flipping houses. Mm. But... But for me, what I would do if I were younger, probably sociologist. Okay. I think I would be more interested in moving along the lines of that kind of, you know, some kind of social anthropologist of some sort. You'd be good at, you'd be good at, you'd be good at it because that used to yeah. be my former job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you'd be good at it. Yeah, really? Yeah, you really yeah. I agree with Aisha. Absolutely. Absolutely. Damn it. Well, you know, they don't, you know, had us singing for coins as kids. <laughs> I think that's one of the really, you know, I know when I was working in advertising, one thing that we started having happen was that there are so few uh, people of color that go into it, like African-American yes. kids. Yep. And, you know, and I was often thinking, because no one's really broken it down to them. Like, this is what's available and it's fun. Until Spike Lee came along, actually. Spike was really one of the first who started to say, hey, wait a minute, you can do this as a director, you can have yeah. an agency. And, you know, I worked with Spike at uh, the agency I was working for uh, was the parent agency of his agency. So uh, Aisha, Aisha, she doesn't want to write a book. Look at the name dropping. <laughs> going. She don't want to write a book. All right. Okay. No, but I mean, I'm just saying, I think that the, if when we're young and they don't, open up these opportunities it's like when i was you know so bad at certain things like calculating things or uh you know didn't want to go and do geometry even at like eight years old or 10 or whatever you're where you are they should just set up a dollhouse give you the measuring stuff and let you start trying to figure out how to decorate that house how to do the wall space how to do everything because I also had a stint in interior design, which is really my heart. And I'm mm -hmm. pretty, and worked with a few architects. I, I'm a Gemini at heart, you know? I jump all over the place. It's very hard. The problem with books and all this stuff is like, Jill, can you finish one thing? Because everybody <laughs> says that, like, Jill, can you finish? Because I jump, I jump, 
I jump from people, I jump from things, and that is my worst trait, probably. Mm. Getting really, you know, seeing another train, like, let's hop that, let's go. But yeah, I think we need to expose our kids more. And yeah. actually at the H, um, H um, at what your school, Aisha, like these schools, we would go and try to recruit these African-American kids into yeah. coming into advertising because that's why the face of our community, that's where it is. And you want to be there to create what people are seeing. It's yep. important. Controlling, controlling the narrative. Not everybody yeah. can be a singer is what I'm right. trying to say. Controlling the narrative. Or a rapper. Right. It's like, damn. Or a ball no. player. Right. Yeah. Uh, for me, just to end off really quick, I'd say probably one of, I wish I would have started my own business at a younger age. I would have, I yeah. would, I, I begin to think that if I had to do it all over again, I, the most I would have probably went to is college. I don't, I would have not gone to university. Wow. I would have. What's the difference between the two in um in can in Toronto in Canada there isn't a lot because college college offers more applied things and offers a lot with uh work terms and internship like a right. lot of like to me and this is me a lot of stuff with university if you're only going to be if you want to be a doctor a lawyer or um, sociologist psychologist but a lot of those other professions are offered at the college Trades. level. And trades. Yeah. I don't know if I do a trade, but certainly something the college level. Like when I finished university, I took a one year course in public relations and marketing. And I learned more about the work world in one year in college than totally. I did four years of university. That's the same with my daughter because she went to school in England. Yeah. So she was in college. And then when she decided to leave and come here, everyone was like, but she should be back in high school because she's 17. It was like a really funny year. Yep. And then here, the idiot teachers took him forever to understand I had to go and have her grades transferred. I was like, she's uh, done. She's actually yeah. done with this. She yeah. was done with American high school at 16. Yeah. Pazzo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is, uh, Following my dad sets uh, a teacher. I actually applied for teachers college twice, did not get in, and I didn't want to be a lifelong, ah. lifelong teacher, a, a, a black kid. And I still miss not being in that classroom. Uh, the that's a whole other story when we do. But our you are a teacher in a way. Yeah, I am. I, I, I realize I can do my. Kid. I don't have to be in a classroom. But the, the the two years I spent working in a school were two of the most fabulous years I had prefer professionally and personally in my life because the group of people I worked with were absolutely I fabulous. bet you were the best teacher. I would have been like, I'm going to Dr. Vibe's class uh, well, I can't wait. Or well, was there, it Mr. Vibe? <laughs> well, <laughs> quick little story for us to close out. My first day in class, I was, I was in an area that was Jewish, upper middle class. I come in my first day. I'm I'm in a junior kindergarten. So oh. first of all, there ain't <laughs> no one that looked like me in the junior kindergarten, right? Uh -huh. No yeah. one. <laughs> and so within ten minutes, girl comes up to me, comes up to my knees, and and says to me, she's got long blonde hair all the way down her back, blue eyes. Asked me, how come you're so dark? Oh, no. So I'm going. I.e. And you know, we all know kids. They want an answer. They do. They want an answer. So I said, Terry, when <laughs> God created him, you see, Jordy knows there's a craziness. This, so I said, Terry, when God made us, I was in the toaster longer than you. Oh, so cute. she sort of looks at me and just like runs away. Next day. Guess who comes knocking on oh, the classroom okay. door? They were in a toaster, and you were in a Jewish school. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, well, I didn't. It, it didn't. It did, but it didn't go down that way. Oh, okay. But, but all right. But next day, guess who comes knocking at the classroom <laughs> door at nine a.m.? Terry. Terry's well, mom. Bingo. <laughs> Terry's mom. So Terry. Oh, is Mr. Gao here? I'm going, lady. <laughs> oh, Come no. on now. So right. she said, so I go, hi, how you doing? Said, 
Well, last night at our table, <laughs> Terry told us a little interesting story. And I go, here goes my teaching career done in two days. Right. She said, we laughed so Oh, much. that's great. She says, we laughed so hard. She goes, here's my business card. Uh, she was a lawyer. She said, and also I'm the head of the PTA. If you need any help, you call me. Oh, that's great. wow. Yeah, that could have gone either way. Oh, yeah. It could have went know. many different ways. And with the wrong child who's like, yes. I was in a toaster. Yeah, right. no, that's right. great. That is so, so cute. I so love that, that. That's just and often a little fun story. So I have one or two stories too, folks. Just one or of two. You know, I, you can't, do. I can't keep up. Maybe next time we do this, I'll, I'll, I'll give my Kate Bush story. Kate Bush. Yes, I was with her. Oh my God, I one love on, Kate Bush. One on one for one hour. Oh, oh wow. you've got to tell my daughter that. That is, she loved her. <laughs> so Are you that, joking? That, that no. Because she never goes anywhere. She doesn't travel. Oh, no, this is way early, early Korean. If um, she didn't like it, then you no. actually she had very few interviews. Yes, very, very few interviews, and uh, so. But that's another story, folks. We're done. <laughs> we are done. But I'll tell you something. This was fun. Uh, yeah. Was well, fun. Jen is saying this show is fabulous. Hope you do another with this question format. Absolutely. Chris says, thank you, Dr. Vibe. Aisha and Jill, the very best of you all. Aisha, stay safe for the opinion. Well, and you too, Chris. Yes. Too. Um, Thanks, Jen. J J Django says, Django. fresh Kaiser rolls? Really, yes. Jill? Yes, yes. <laughs> I have to send you some. Yes, so there you go. So, folks, thank you, as always, for making it a great time. Uh, Kaiser cult. This is a lot of fun. And yes, we do have lives outside of politics and doing those <laughs> blue rains. Yes. Great show. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Cinema Canella also. Cinema. Hey, Stevens. Thank you everyone who came on tonight. And as always, before we close out, we have to say thank you to the two great ladies. Feel better, Aisha. Yes. Hang in there. Sure. You're past the eighth day tonight yeah. so we'll all be sending you strength that's the day getting over that hump you'll do absolutely. it absolutely she will definitely make it so before we go any further we close out as always ms jones how can people encounter you uh jill d jones at twitter all right uh aisha k's daggers uh, aisha staggers at twitter there you go. And myself, the best place to get a hold of me is via my website, the D R V I V E S H O W dot com. Amazing conversation tonight. Love it. One other thing I want to tell people you can watch replays of our wonderful epic conversations on the Dr. Vibe show on YouTube and Facebook, or you can go to my website, the D R V I B E S H O W dot com. Let's see, someone else has something to say before we leave. And Black Beauty says, this was beautiful and thanks for sharing. We appreciate you right back. As always, we'd like to close off with this. Live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger. Block assumptions and aim bigger, aim better, aim higher, aim wider. Love, faith, and respect. And remember to give yourselves grace. Hey. Subscribe to the Dr. Vibe channel on YouTube. L would love to have you subscribe. We're now at 645 subscribers. And a lot of them have been coming on because of these two wonderful ladies. Because always get great feedback and views when they are on the platform. So appreciate it and don't take it for granted. And we will be back, should be back next Saturday. And do provide us feedback. If you like this format, uh, we can do it every few, at least once every quarter. And uh, in between, always send us questions. God bless. Peace be well. Keep the faith. And everyone say a prayer for Aisha. We want her back at 100%. Keep the faith, everybody. Be well.